We'll be giving away free books this week, so make sure to watch to the end for details. I love the King James Version. I love the King James Version because it's beautiful, because it's uh, been a translation of the Bible that has edified uh, millions of English-speaking Christians around the world. My children go to a school where they're required to memorize verses in the King James Version. When I uh, think of Psalm 23, I, I can't think of it with a modern translation. I have to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, having said all that, that the King James is a great translation to read, to use, to enjoy, um, is it the best translation? And, and maybe even more than that, can we say that other translations are bad and misleading? We, we cannot say that, and we should not say that. Now, it's one thing to say, I prefer the King James Version. It's another thing to insist that it's the best or to denigrate other translations. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the arguments people make in arguing the King James is the best translation. This is a very short video, so I'm gonna recommend a book to you if you wanna look at this in more detail. There's a really good book on this by James White called The King James Only Controversy. So you can buy that on Amazon or somewhere else. The King James Only Controversy by James White is a great book to look at this in more detail. Okay, one of the arguments that King James Onlyists will make is they'll say, hey, look, look, the NIV or the ESV, look, they remove verses from the Bible. And they'll, for someone who's not familiar with this, they'll, someone will look down, they'll be like, yeah, there's a number 11, and then there's a number 13. They've, they've removed a verse. The modern translation has removed a verse from the Bible. Well, first we need to remember that the versification system we have was, was not present until 1551 when a Parisian printer named Robert Estienne added those verses um, to a diglot version he had. The first English Bible to have versification was the Geneva version in 1560. But a more important question is what is the basis for comparison, right? If the King James only is the basis for comparison, Yes, then this translation has, has removed a verse from the Bible. But really, the basis for comparison, I think we can all agree, are the words of the inspired apostles. So did Matthew write those words, or did Mark write those words, or did Paul write those words? And then whatever translation we have, we want it to reflect the wording of the inspired apostles, not uh, necessarily a 1611 version unless it, all, it accurately represents that wording. And someone may say, well, well how, how is it that those words got in there if, if Matthew didn't write them? But people who study the transmission of the early text, there, there are certain scribal tendencies. And one of them is if it's a parallel passage in the Gospels and the scribes are very familiar with it, and, and it has some wording in Luke maybe that, that Matthew didn't originally have, there's a tendency to provide that, to provide exact harmonization between them. And so we have these tendencies showing up um, in some manuscripts, which this made, made its way into the King James Version. But really the ultimate question for us is, did Matthew write it, did Paul write it? And then we want it in our Bibles. Let's talk about a specific example to help, to help illustrate some of this. So in 1 John chapter five, it describes Jesus as the one who came through the water and the blood, which I think is a reference to his baptism and his death and resurrection. People debate this. But then it goes on to say there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, in some later manuscripts, um, in Latin, and then even much later in Greek, there, there are additional words that, that are in there. I'm reading here from a footnote in a modern translation. It says, in the Vulgate, it also adds, this is the Latin translation, uh, testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that testify on earth. And, and it has a note here, this, these words are not found in any Greek manuscript before the 14th century. So, I mean, we have a huge amount of time where these, these words are not found in any Greek manuscript. And then they're written in the margin because they're known from a Latin translation. I think there's only one Greek manuscript, handwritten manuscript that's found in, and some people think it was produced for the purpose of pressuring Erasmus to include these words in his Greek New Testament. Because he said, if you show me one Greek manuscript, I will include them. And someone came up with a Greek manuscript. So he added them in, I think, to his third, the third edition, 1522, of his Greek New Testament. 
So the, these, are, these are words that were translated and are now found in, in the King James Version. But there's no doubt the manuscript tradition is overwhelming and vast that John did not write these words. So what should we do? You say, well, I, you know, I memorized that verse when I was a kid, or I, you know, I know that from, well, well, well again, is what's our, our standard? Is it the Bible that we grew up with? Is it, or is it, again, the, is it the words that the apostle wrote? And we have to admit, though, it might, at points, you say, well, I, you know, I'm familiar with that text. I don't like them cutting that text out. The question is, is that, is it, is it cutting that text out to, to not have it in the modern translation, or is it returning to a more reliable basis for that text? A second argument that some KJV onlyists will make is that they'll attack the character of the transla translators of modern versions. They'll say, well, this guy worked on this modern translation, and here's something he said later in life, or here's something he did later in life. And so this translation is, is corrupt. Certainly, we. The scripture is the judge of our, our lives and character. Um, but uh, someone can be a very good translator and also have a moral failure later in their lives. And if you apply that same principle to the translators of the King James Version, it also, I believe, would fail, especially if you look at King James himself, who was involved in the translation. Or let's take it back even to the Apostles, you know, we took it, take certain snapshots of Peter's life and say, should this guy be allowed to write a book of the Bible because of this moral failure or this inconsistency? So I don't think that that can that standard can consistently stand up. Another criticism, um, maybe really the fundamental one that a King James only person will have of modern translations is that if they understand the issues, they'll say. Um, these modern translations are not based on the most reliable Greek manuscripts. There's different families of Greek language manuscript traditions, and one of them is the Byzantine text tradition, and the King James is based more, more on this family of Greek manuscripts. So one question some people may have is, well, why, why this commitment to the Byzantine text tradition, or why did the King James translators in, in 1611, why did they rely upon this? When the Greek and Hebrew Bible were sort of rediscovered, we could say, during the time of the Reformation, where people went back and said, hey, you know, we've been reading the Latin translation for a thousand years, what does the, what does the Greek and Hebrew really say? when they went back to that, there was a demand for, well, we need copies of, of the Greek New Testament so we can see for ourselves. And the, copy, the copies that began to circulate uh, were based upon the Byzantine text tradition because that's what was available uh, at that geographic place and time for those early workers in the Greek New Testament. So uh, one of the most influential of these, what's considered the first published printed Greek New Testament was Erasmus's Greek New Testament. And I don't remember the exact number of manuscripts he relied on, but it was, it was around 10 or 11. It was a small number. It was based on what he had available to him at that time and place. And it ended up through that and through subsequent publications of the Greek New Testament, the Byzantine text tradition became sort of accepted as, as the standard, but later as more and more Greek manuscripts began to be discovered and compared, and as we now have nearly 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts, it causes us to, to rejoice in the wealth of, of manuscripts we have. Not to not say, oh, these are, you know, get these away, uh, let's just, let's burn all these and let's stick with the ones that, that, all, that are similar to our early translations. Now, the majority of biblical scholars say, hey, this is a beautiful wealth of manuscripts. We have these manuscripts that are Byzantine, Alexandrian, uh, Caesarean. We have you know, over 5,000, nearly 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts or portions of manuscripts. And so we have every word of God that has was given to the apostles preserved, it's preserved through this, this symphony of manuscripts. Not in any one, you know, it'd be like if someone came up in court and they, you said, well, I've got a witness in court. Here's my one witness. You're like, well, that's good. But, or if I say, I've, I've got a witness in court, I've got 6,000 witnesses. I think I would, I would say, I wanna listen to the 6,000 witnesses 
and listen to them and realize there are minor differences that, that we can compare and understand them what, what Matthew, Mark, Paul originally wrote. So the belief that the Byzantine text tradition is the most reliable is, I would argue, something based on someone's faith assertion rather than on the actual historical evidence of what manuscripts are early and how they were transmitted and the actual scribal variations between them. And looking at that, we, could, we should say, God has left us a wealth of manuscript evidence that, that vastly agrees but has minor differences. And, <clears throat> and we should lay all those manuscripts out side by side and, and look at the evidence. Uh, another argument I, I would say against arguing the King James is the best or the most reliable or everyone should use it is the fact that the English language has changed radically over 400 years. If you just give the King James Version to <clears throat> somebody you meet on the street, they're gonna have a hard time understanding it. And uh, I once had someone argue with me, well, they could buy a dictionary. <laughs> okay, you can buy a dictionary from the, <laughs> from the 1600s, but is that really the vision we have for Bible translation? Here's a Bible, here's a dictionary of the English language in the 1600s. I hope you'll read it and look up every fifth word. I think we realize that language changes over time, that's normal, and we want a Bible that's in the, the readable, understandable language of the day, just like the Greek of the New Testament is written in the readable, understandable Greek of the first century. When they translated the, the Hebrew Old Testament and quoted it in the New Testament, they did so in readable, understandable Koine Greek, and so they've given us there sort of a implicit apostolic permission to translate the Word of God into understandable language of our day. Yeah, final statement about the King James Version. One thing I would, I would challenge people to do, especially those maybe who are committed to the King James, is to read the preface, the translator's preface, which you can find online to the, King James, the original King James Version, and you'll see that these guys didn't think they were presenting a once-for-all this is the English translation for all time. They saw themselves as, as building on the work of others who had preceded them. Many people don't know there were, there's a, a spate of English translations coming out in the 15 and 1600s, the Coverdale Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible. The King James translators saw themselves building upon this tradition and also providing a work that was not final, that they realized that new insights would come into the Greek and Hebrew language and, and uh, greater precision and expression, and so, so that's important to realize. Again, I like to read it. I've memorized portions of it. My kids have memorized portions of it. But do I think it's the most reliable? No. Do I think it's that other translations are bad? No. We have excellent modern translations of the Bible, and they're along a spectrum of more word for word and more thought for thought. And along that spectrum, I would recommend the ESV, I'd recommend the Christian Standard Bible, the NIV, the NLT. These are all great modern translations that accurately convey the meaning of the apostles. Thanks for watching Honest Answers. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll be giving away three copies of the book that was mentioned in this episode. Go to the link in the description below to find out how you can enter.